So our Bible reading today is from 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord, before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. <clears throat> there were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. <clears throat> and he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Again the Lord replied to Samuel, Sorry, I've lost my place. Again the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke, of his family from beginning to end. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much, Annie. And um, we're going to have our ears tingling now um, as we hear from Jason and Tracy. Uh, lovely to hear how God has called them uh, into ministry in Thailand. Um, so I'd like to invite Jason, Tracy, Libby, and Ruby to come up. Um, so just to introduce them, um, we, we first kind of met online uh, when we formed this partnership during lockdown. Uh, someone said to me, everything seems to be dated by before lockdown and post lockdown, doesn't it nowadays? But it was over lockdown that we first made that connection, had our first Zoom call. And uh, so it's lovely to have you here in person now for the first time that we've been able to, to meet you. So thank you for coming and sharing with us today. Uh, both now you're going to share and then uh, we'll have lunch together. Uh, and there'll be an opportunity for Q&A over lunch. So over to you. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, lovely to be with you this morning. It's our first time in Tewkesbury. Uh, we, we missed the reenactment yesterday, unfortunately, a little bit late when we to go for that. So, uh, but uh, yeah, maybe another time. Um, just to um, introduce ourselves, we are uh, Jason, Tracy, Ruby and Libby. We are working with the Church Mission Society. Uh, we've been with the Church Mission Society about 19 years now. Uh, the past 11 of those, we have been working in Thailand, in Chiang Mai, in North Thailand. Um, we are seconded from the Church Mission Society to OMF, which is Overseas Mission Fellowship. So just to give you a little bit of background to, to who we are and to what we do. Um, so my role is to, uh, to work as a personnel manager for OMF in North Thailand. Uh, and I'm responsible for looking after about, about 150 adults and then children who are missionaries in various countries uh, across that area, Southeast Asia. Uh, and my role involves uh, recruitment and selection of people. It involves welcoming and orienting people when they come, particularly to Thailand, to get them help get them settled in. Uh, it involves visas, which is always a big, a big stress trying to get visas in uh, in many many countries. So part, that's part of my role to liaise with them with that. Uh, also involved in administrative support for people, um, as well as personal care, uh, as people come, adjust, go through different challenges and things like that while they're on the field. Uh, we also help facilitate trainings as well at the center where we're based. Um, 
So it's quite a uh, quite a varied role. I also have some other personal managers who I also um, support and oversee. Also. Uh, so I'm Tracy, and I am primarily a housewife and a mom, and I am so thankful and privileged to have been able to do that and have the opportunity to have the kids and been able to raise them and uh, be the home-based person. It's been really, really good, um, and I think it's great if moms can do that. Uh, I'm also a child safety officer for OMF, so I support families based in China, Myanmar, Laos, and North Thailand, and I just help them work through any child safety or safeguarding issues that have come through, or if there's been any accusations made against any OMF members. Um, so it's very much a supportive role, and I am so grateful for God's mercy that we've had very few cases to deal with. And I say that with amazement when I think of how many mission families are on the field and what life is like these days, I feel grateful for God's protection over people. I'm also a Sunday school team leader and a Sunday school teacher. I just want to champion uh, all you Sunday school people. It is such an important role. Teach your kids. Teach your kids. If we want to see the world change, if we want to see our country changed, change it now by teaching your children. It's a, a great privilege to be in. I am in a age 7 to 11 class and we have about 35 to 40 international kids and uh, we go to an international church so they're kids from China, America, Germany, Korea, some Thai, they're from all over the place and um, our group we work through the Old Testament and the groups before us work through the New Testament so that by the time the child gets to youth They've been through the whole of the Bible and done all the Bible stories. And then the youth leaders take them on and do like hot topics and all sorts of other topics of Christian living. So it works really well together. Hi, uh, I'm Ruby. I'm 17 and I have one year left at school. And after I graduate, I'm hoping to go to Cape and Ray Bible College in the Lake District to study uh, foundations in Christian living. Hi, I'm Libby. I'm 15. Uh, I've got three years left at school, and I don't know what I'm going to do later. <laughs> I can find plenty of jobs for her. Don't you worry, Libby. <laughs> uh, we just want to start first by saying thank you. It takes a lot of faith to step out and support a mission partner. It takes more faith to step out and support mission partners that you've never met before. And it takes an even more faith to step out and support mission partners in admin. We are supporters. We're not running orphanages. We don't rescue traffic girls. We're not save, doing life-saving surgery. We don't do anything glamorous or sexy at all. We really don't. But we are grateful that you help us support other mission partners and help them stay on the field. I know... Uh, it's tempting when we're in the UK in the position of just giving and praying that we kind of think, oh, well, that's all I'm doing. But actually, you do a huge job. If it wasn't for you, there would not be people on the mission field. There wouldn't be families there. There wouldn't be people who are reached for the gospel. So don't think that that uh, prayer or whatever you give is a small thing. It really isn't. It achieves a lot. We may not see the results this side of eternity, but I'm confident that uh, Jesus will encourage us with all that he did, with everything that we had to give and that you've all given for sure. So I just want to say thank you so much. Also want to say thank you on behalf of the girls. There's no such thing as free education in Thailand. It doesn't matter if you're Thai or if you're a foreigner. Every Everybody pays for their uh, education. So I feel grateful that your support enables us to keep the girls in school. Really, really grateful for that. So thank you. We're also thankful for your partnership in helping us journey with you. We really enjoyed the week of prayer that you did. Um, was it January? Uh, we were sent the leaflet. We were able to print it out and pray every day as you did. Uh, so that was really nice for us. And 
to hear all that you've been involved in and look at your website and get to know you a bit. So we are very, very grateful for your partnership in helping us and in allowing us to journey with you. Thank you. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Philippians 1, verse 3 to 6. So, yeah, I want to start with this verse, really, just as a reminder, and Tracy's talked about it a little bit, uh, about the importance, importance sorry, of partnership, that wherever we are, whatever we are doing, we are all partners. Uh, in the gospel. So we partner together. We pray together. God enables us to proclaim the gospel so that everyone has the chance to hear and choose Christ for themselves. So partnership, prayer, and the gospel. How have we seen God work through partnership, prayer, and the gospel in Chiang Mai, Thailand? So even though Tracy and I both work in uh, in support roles, uh, we're not going to talk about those today for two reasons, really. Firstly, it's probably a little bit boring for you guys to hear stories of support roles. Uh, and secondly, confidentiality-wise, and some things we, we really can't share. So today we wanted to focus particularly on two ways in which we've seen God at work uh, in the lives of an individual uh, and also in the lives of a family. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to act for his good pleasure. Philippians 2, verse 13. Just to say, I am so going to get bifocals for our next lot of glasses. Anybody have this problem? You're just like constantly up and down. Oh, it's a pain. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a story about a man that we'll call uh, Narin. We have full permission uh, to share his story. And um, he also just wanted to say thank you to those of you who uh, may read the newsletters and have prayed for him. We're grateful for that, and I know he is very much. So in uh, January, uh, I, God very specifically called me to start walking around our neighborhood at 5 o'clock every morning. So uh, it's where we live next to a highway, and we have quite a big block that we can walk around, and it's about an hour's walk. So I've done this many times before, but I usually go, if I ever do, at 6 a.m. every morning. So I didn't really know why I had to get up at 5. I thought, well, maybe it's just for good health. So whatever it is, I'll obey and go. So on the first day, as I was walking down the road, I saw a tent on the pavement next to the motorway that's near our house. I hadn't seen it before, so I was a bit surprised to see it. And I thought, I'll just walk on, just walk past it. So the next morning, I went again, and I saw a man next to the tent taking it down. Again, just walked on. Uh, it, was, it was quite dark, and I didn't really know who it was, so uh, I just continued. And I went again the following day and saw his, him taking it down again. So this time, I smiled, and he smiled back. And we decided as a family that we would start to pray for him, and we prayed every night. I went again the following day and decided I would brave it and talk to him. So uh, the first thing he said was, uh, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And I thought, well, I'm definitely not afraid. I'm twice as big as you are for starters, so I'm really not concerned, really not. Uh, this is a man. Uh, we found out he spoke uh, fluent English. So it was very easy to chat with him. And we've, I discovered that he'd been homeless for two years and was desperately trying to find a job. So uh, before he'd been homeless, he had been a storyboard writer. So he did a lot of the cartoons and pictures uh, for a local petroleum company. And since then, uh, well, many factors had caused him to become homeless, uh, to lose his job. Um, but since then, he had actually walked uh, from Bangkok all the way to Chiang Mai, um, which was several weeks walking with different people picking him up and helping him on the way. And he'd also applied for many, many, many jobs and been to interviews, but never been taken on. So he's 51, and we discovered as we got to know him that there's an unspoken age limit uh, for careers for jobs in Thailand, and it's about 35 to 40. So it's hard when you're over 40 
to uh, get a job, which was one of the reasons that people didn't take him. And um, probably because he looks homeless too. That was probably another reason, I'm sure. Um, so as we got to know him uh, over the next few weeks, we discovered that he slept in his tent on the pavement every day until 5 a.m. And then he would pack up and go to a local petrol station and sit for a while, which is why I had never met him before when I'd been uh, on the same walk at 6. So I thought, oh, that's obviously why God asked me to get up at 5. So um, after sitting at the petrol station, when it reached about 9 o'clock, Narin would then spend his days at the local supermarket and would just sit at one of their tables, which I have to admire because if I was him and I was starving hungry, I would have been very tempted to go and steal something, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you to just sit there and watch people fill their shopping trolleys? And But he never did. He had great integrity and he just relied on people uh, giving him things. Uh, so we befriended him and uh, we would sometimes sit with him as a family at the petrol station or sometimes we'd go and sit at the supermarket with him, uh, maybe have lunch with him. And we also uh, began to invite him for dinner once a week and help him out in small ways that we could and that we felt were appropriate. We shared his hopes as he applied for yet another job and his sadness when he was turned down repeatedly. We spent time and talked to him about God and Jesus and would often pray with him for his life and especially for a job. That is one of the advantages of working in a Buddhist country is that um, Buddhists are very happy for you to pray with them. They don't have any problem with Jesus or God. Their only problem is accepting him as the only God. So it was, it was easy for us to pray and talk with him. We invited him to come to church uh, one day, but he said he wouldn't. He refused to come, but that was fine. So we continued to meet him and kept praying with him and for him. And then one day, just before Easter, he said he'd like to come. We were like, oh, wow. Yeah, so we were a bit nervous. You know, would he like it? Would he enjoy it? How would it be? Would people say hello? And, but he did. He came and he enjoyed it. And he actually said he'd come again. So he's been every week since Easter. He's always early and he never misses. And there's no free tea or coffee, no biscuits at our church. There's nothing at all. It's just church. It's just church. And that's, yeah, he still comes. Recently, uh, in the past few weeks, uh, Narin applied for a job as a translator, which was a really new venture for him. It, before that, he'd always employed, uh, applied for IT jobs. And finally, after two years of being unemployed, he got a temporary three-month contract, which we could not believe. We were astounded, and he was astounded. So he started work. And he was doing really well until one day he got knocked off his push bike. Um, so we, uh, we took him to the hospital and it turned out that he'd got a broken wrist and a broken arm. So he couldn't therefore ride his push bike to work and he also couldn't set his tent up anymore. So um, we, with the help of a friend, we managed to help him find uh, somewhere to stay, um, which was good. And then as he was recovering, he one day announced that he'd become a Christian and he wanted to be baptized. We were amazed, amazed. And one of the church leaders, we took him to church, uh, or we, we put him in contact with one of the elders at church and they chatted with him, gave him a Bible. And um, yeah, he had, in, in their chats with him, uh, he showed he had very clear understanding of what it means to be a Christian, to give your life to Christ, to accept you're a sinner to accept your need for forgiveness, invite Christ into your heart, which he did. So we're very excited to go back in August and uh, when he'll be baptized. So recently, uh, Narin found his first paycheck and uh, he found his own room to rent. And uh, he moved in the week before we left, which was perfect timing because the rains have just started now in Thailand. So it means he's off the street, in his own room, in a job out of the rain and uh, he's safe. It's been an exciting journey with Narin, but I have to say it's uh, not been without its stresses or challenges as we've wondered how to help, what should we do, what should we say, what should we not say, 
you know what 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 the implications of everything and and as we've had some of the I'm going to say spicy chats with Narin. Yeah, they've been. I've had some good chats with him at times, but it's been very good. But God has enabled it. As we look back and reflect on our, this, our initial reading of Philippians, we can see how God enabled us to partner with others who prayed with him, prayed for him, who helped him, and who talked to him about the gospel. So I would ask, please, if you ever do have a minute, to you remember. Narin, please do pray for him, uh, that he will keep his job, his contract comes to an end soon, that he'll stay off the streets, that he'll grow in his faith, and also that other homeless people will come to know Christ in the same way. Come and see the works of God, who is awesome in his deeds towards the sons of men. Psalm 66, verse 5. So the second story I want to share with you, and again, we have full permission uh, from the family. Uh, is about a young family called Paul from Papua New Guinea, his wife Nancy from Nagaland in India, no, next to India, and their little five-year-old girl, Nimbine. Um, for those of you who, again, who read uh, the newsletters and pray and have prayed for this family already, Paul was very specific in asking me to thank you for your prayers for him. He, they're all just overjoyed that people here would take the time to pray. So thank you. So the family, Paul, Nancy, and Nimbine, are based in Chiang Mai, and they work for the Bible League. Uh, they teach Bible-based literacy, which is a program that helps um, people learn English by using the Bible. And uh, they've actually led uh, many ties to Christ uh, through using this program. So 18 months ago, Nancy had a major bleed in her brain leading to a severe stroke, and she actually collapsed at home in front of Nimbine, her little girl. She was in a coma for two months, and she needed to have half her skull temporarily removed to relieve the pressure in her head. So when, when, you go to, when we went to see her, she, she had her head was like this one side, and the other side it caved in, yeah, where, and the skull was kept in the fridge in the hospital until uh, it could be replaced six months later. So at the time of the stroke, we didn't actually know the family. Uh, we were told about them in a prayer meeting at school. So we started to pray, and then we felt God's prompting to, to go and visit, to go and get to know them, and to partner with them on their journey. Miraculously, Nancy came out of a coma, and she survived, uh, but she did have, uh, and still does have, significant loss of function on her right side and loss of most of her speech. The hospital bills, there's no free health care in Thailand. There's no NHS. The hospital bills were enormous. But in total, 1.2 million baht, which is around 28,000 uh, pounds, was raised to pay for all the surgery and the care. It was incredible to see God's provision for this lovely little family. Previously, Nancy had been an evangelist, a singer, and could speak several languages. And I think it's fair to say that she's found it crushing to find herself in this situation. But she still manages to smile. She amazes me every time I see her. And you can see she's smiling on the photo, which they all got dressed up ready for the photo, actually. <laughs> Uh, and it's remarkable how she keeps going. Please, if you have a minute and you remember them, please do pray that Nancy will heal to the best that she can be. And for Paul, as he cares for her, and Nimbine, as she recovers from the trauma of it all and learns to care for her mom. Um, and also, they continue, amazingly, they still continue in their outreach to ties through the Bible-based literacy program. So please do remember them in your prayers. My father is always, uh, is always sorry. My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. John five seventeen. So these these two stories uh, we've talked about Narin, we've talked about Paul, Nancy, and Nimine, really clearly show partnership, prayer, and the gospel working together in the lives of individuals, in the lives of families. But it's it's always God, isn't it, that's behind everything that goes on. The things that we see, he's always at work. And I think you know, in a time now where, where so many things seem challenging, seem 
um, out of control to some degree, it's really encouraging just to see that, yeah, God is still at work. I mean, we had <clears throat> Andrew's story before about how God's provision for him. Uh, and we've talked about the people here as well. God is still at work. And he grants us the honor of working with him, of working for him. And us coming together in partnership and prayer to achieve his purpose. And it's very much a team effort, isn't it? We're all like a small piece in a very, very large jigsaw. God had already brought Christians across Narin's path. So even before we got involved with Narin, other Christians had been involved in his life. With Paul, Nancy and Nimbine, God brought so many different people into their lives um, since the accidents, since the health issues. And even now, there's more and more people coming into their lives. So it's just encouraging to see that God knows. God knows our situation. He knows what we need. And he's at work, even though we might not always be aware of it. He is still at work. And we are called to partner with him, to partner with others and to pray and to continue to share the gospel. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. It's been really interesting to hear um, your story and how God's been at work in your ministry and your life together in Chiang Mai. And a couple of words just struck me as you were, you were speaking there. Um, one was called, so we had the story about the call of Samuel, and a very familiar story to us all, I'm sure, about the call of Samuel's little boy and how he was called to serve the Lord, to become a prophet for the nation of Israel. Um, and, uh, and your own sense of call to go and live and work in Thailand. But also on a daily basis, uh, Tracy, you're saying about how God called you to go and do that walk at five o'clock in the morning. And I think that mm. kind of resonates with us here. There's, there's a connection because we can all be called by God to just live out our daily lives uh, and respond to the things that he calls us in day by day, wherever we are, wherever we live. Uh, to just help people be available to people, to have a conversation or a word um, with other people and just share something of his love with them. Um, so that, that word of call really kind of responds. How did you come to be in Thailand? Perhaps you could just share a little bit about, because I know you were in Nepal first of all. And Ruby and Libby, where were you born? I was born in Nepal. I was born in the UK. You are born in the UK and you are born in Nepal. So you've lived, you've lived virtually all your lives overseas haven't you um, and never lived really for any length of time here in the UK so that that's an interesting context isn't it we'll talk maybe a little bit about that over lunch today. but just say a little bit about how you felt called to ministry in Thailand why Thailand um may I go go back a bit early so I became a Christian when I was 14 at a Billy Graham conference in uh, Liverpool and I read Youth with a Mission uh, the book is that really you Lord uh, which was quite life-changing for me and I felt very much called to overseas service so I did my nurse training um, and I thought well, I'll probably be able to get overseas if I've got some training behind me. Uh, Jason and I married and uh, Jason did um, one year Bible course. I'd already done time with Y1 doing a discipleship training school. And we decided that, yeah, we both felt, yes, we, we think we're called to mission. So we applied to voluntary service overseas. And we did a year with them in Russia. Um, it was a, only um, a year's contract because of uh, difficulty in Russia at the time. But we did that to see, A, are we definitely called to mission? And B, could we hack it? And C, would we still be married at the end of it? Yeah, yeah so that was our reason for going. So uh, it was a great year. And at the end of the year, God very clearly said, you are called to Asia. It was very clear. So... Um, through contacts that Voluntary Service Overseas gave us, we heard of the Church Mission Society, applied to them, and they sent us to Nepal. Uh, we worked at a mission hospital there. Jason was the uh, personnel manager. He looked after all the expats doing housing, finance, visas, medical things for them. And uh, I worked at the nursing school teaching nursing. We had Ruby, and Libby was born just when we were on home leave. But we were there for eight years, and they were wonderful years. They really were. Uh, but at the end of that eight years, we felt that uh, God was calling us to move on to the next place. And we ended up in Thailand through a friend, actually. A friend in Nepal had gone to Thailand. She was also with the Church Mission Society. And she invited us to have a look at a job there that was actually for Friends of China. But... In going through the interview with Friends of China, 
they uh, put us in contact with OMF, who said, actually, we'll have you, and here's your visa. So that's how it was all like friends of friend, you know, friends and conversations. That's really how we ended up in Thailand uh, doing the job that we're doing. That's amazing. So if if, if anyone here feels prompted today to uh, to by the Lord to um, to go and work somewhere, and that's not just you know going for a holiday to Thailand, because that's where we most associate going to Thailand for going for a holiday. Actually, who's been to Thailand on on holiday? Okay, oh right, so a good number of us have been uh, to Thailand, or well, fair spattering of us. Um, so, you know, we know what it's like for two weeks, it's lovely to go and stay. But obviously to live there for 11 years is very different. So what would you say were some of the really big challenges of living in a foreign country, and particularly in, in that particular context in, in Thailand and yep. Chiang Mai? The heat. Yeah. I mean, the, the heat is especially yeah, coming from northern England. I don't England. you to sit on the fence on this one, Jason. We need a clear answer, okay? <laughs> yeah, I mean, coming, coming from the north of England, you know, the heat in Thailand is just like, oh, it's just too much at some at some points. I, I think um, challenges would be, of course, you know, missing family. Uh, you know, that's a big, big thing. And missing many, many family family events and different weddings and things like that. That's quite hard. Anything from your side, Jason? Yeah, probably the same, I think. Yeah, probably yeah. Those, those things, I think. That's always going to be a pull on your heart, isn't it? The family mm. side of things would be so far away. And if your parents are kind of getting on in years and uh, mm. feeling that responsibility for them, that can be difficult. Yeah. Uh, those yeah. kind of challenges. Yeah. Um, it'd be lovely just to pray for you guys now. I'm going to ask the music group to come back and get ready for our final song this morning. But before I do that, I'd just like to say if anyone is feeling God prompting them this morning, not necessarily to go to uh, Thailand, it's lovely to have Rachel with us here again today from the Solomon Islands, there we go, over there, um, going back uh, shortly. But it, maybe God is just calling you to give your life to, to him, to Christ, to come and give your life in service of him. Uh, if God is prompting you in any way this morning, then I'd really encourage you to come up here for some prayer after our service. Our prayer team will be here, and we'd love to pray for you. It may be to give your life to Christ. It might be that you feel he's prompting you uh, to enter into a job or a situation, whatever it is, let's stand with you and pray that into your life. Let's respond, as Samuel did, as this family have done, as many of us do, to God's call and say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Lord, thank you for Jason, Tracy, Ruby and Libby. Thank you for enabling us to partner with them in mission whether it's here in Tewkesbury or whether it's in Thailand. Thank you, Lord, that you are working out your purposes around the world and you call us into partnership with you and your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for that great adventure of faith. Uh, and we pray for your blessing on this family, as David has always prayed, already prayed. We ask, Lord, that your spirit will empower them and equip them. And just as we have heard about your provision for Andrew on that footpath in Cornwall, and for Jason and Tracy as they live out their life and calling in Thailand. So we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to undertake for them, provide for them in every way, that they may celebrate your faithfulness and your goodness as they recognize your hand upon their lives. So fill them afresh today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.